would like to thank all of you for joining me today. Um, it really is an honor to get to speak with you. Uh, as one of our inpatient pharmacists, uh, I don't really get the opportunity to meet a lot of our transplant recipients, so it really is an honor. Uh, I will kind of give you a little bit of background on, on myself. I had my transplant specific training at the Medical University of South Carolina, um, specializing specifically in pharmacy. And uh, I have been practicing here at the University of Minnesota for about a year and a half now. So I've been I kind of missed the cold. So I decided to come on up back north. So I want to thank you all for your time today. Um, my talk is really going to focus more so on the uh, dietary supplements, but I do have a pretty heavy section in the CBD products as well. And we lightly touch on the medical marijuana, um, as you'll see kind of moving forward. So I just wanted to make sure that I dis disclose to all of you that I have no financial con conflicts and nothing to disclose. Uh, I have no stake in big pharma. I am coming to you strictly as someone who wants to provide clinical information on kind of where our studies look at these drugs and dietary supplements, kind of the information revolving around those drugs and supplements, as well as the CBD and THC products. And I will be discussing some off-label use of cannabis products, dietary supplements, and possible effects of implications uh, in solid organ transplant patients. So today's goals, um, we're gonna start by kind of discussing the history, current legal status uh, per state and uses of mer medical marijuana and cannabis related products. We're then gonna review potential adverse effects and drug interactions for those cannabis products with an emphasis specifically in CBD as they do share many of those adverse effects. We're then gonna move on to discussing several dietary supplements and this is gonna be with special regards to indications, some suggested intake values of those supplements, as well as some kind of generalized safety about those supplements as well. And then lastly, we're gonna determine the appropriateness of each individual dietary supplement. And this is gonna be information specific to heart transplant recipients and or those who have had a left ventricular site assist device placed. So this is just kind of the more you know history about kind of cannabis throughout our, our existence. So this is more so a reference slide for those of you who like the fun facts, but essentially what we can see is that it is a product that has been used ever since 2900 BC. So it's been around forever. So how can some of these folks say like, oh, you know, this seems to be so new when obviously this is something that has gone so far back in our history. So kind of just some information regarding the regulation. So it is still federally a Schedule One narcotic, along with heroin, LSD, and peyote. So our, our federal government has deemed it to be a pretty significant drug. Uh, substances in the schedule typically have no current accepted medical use in the United States, lack an accepted safety for use under medical supervision, and a, have a high potential for abuse. Now you may be thinking, well, isn't this talk about some of the medical marijuana? And, and this is kind of the conflict between the federal government's stake as a Schedule One narcotic versus kind of the more statehood, uh, local government classifications. The Food and Drug Administration has uh, cannabis not as a recognized uh, medical value or use, even though we do currently have some studies that are being performed. So, I know that many of you may not be residing in the state of Minnesota, so I did want to provide a more uh, geological basis for what states do have legalized, uh, fully legalized marijuana, which states have legal for medical use marijuana, which states have a limited THC medical use legality, and which states are just purely prohibited. Knowing that there is a major difference here just in the Midwest between the Dakotas and Minnesota, uh, versus Iowa and Wisconsin, as, and then Michigan being uh, fully legalized. And if I may, Glenn, uh, jump back to that slide. One thing that I did want to point out is that uh, just as of last week, this state uh, map is now actually out of date in that one of these states in the Northeast is now moved to fully legalized. So as you can see, this legal status of the states can differ even you know, on a month to month to year to year basis. So what do we know about the data revolving around specifically medical marijuana? So there are a large number of papers 
that have been published, but there are a few active trials currently going on looking at these drug interactions. So that has looked at some of the prescription use as well as the non-prescription use. They uh, look specifically for drug-drug interactions with some of our mainstay chemotherapeutics. There have been over 3,000 publications that I have personally tried to pull from a database source known as PubMed. Think of it similar to the, the Google of looking for research papers. And these are all that have been published between 1990 and 2018. So as I mentioned, there are still few active trials going on. Um, approximately 80 active trials to be kind of, if I wanted to shoot a ballpark. So how does this drug work? So THC, as well as the CBD products, which we'll be discussing later, they impact these receptors that are in the brain. So there are multiple receptors in the brain through uh, whether it's, you know, medicines that can act to prevent seizures, whether it's medicines that can act to help with Alzheimer's. Um, there are many, many of these receptors. Specific to medical marijuana and CBD products are these CB1 and CB2 receptors in the brain. And turning these receptors on or turning these receptors off can have very different results. So when we look at the CB1 receptor itself, this is involved in our central nervous system and our peripheral nervous system, meaning our brain and spinal cord for the central, and then all of our nerves that extend into our fingers, our toes, our legs, arms, and chest is our peripheral nervous system. They can also be present on the heart. So not just in the brain and in those nerves, but we can also see impacts on the heart, meaning it can cause it to increase or decrease the rate. We can also see that these are present on the eye and the retina, so our ability to see. Our lungs are also impacted by the CB1 molecule, whether we're able to take these really deep breaths or whether we might have some, some constriction in those lungs that doesn't allow us to take as deep of breaths. The cells of metabolism, specifically in our muscle, in our intestine, and in our fat tissue, also known as the adipose tissue, are also present. There is some impact. Oh you don't mind going back, uh, there is some impact of that CB1 molecule in the reproductive system. And then there's also some effects that we can see on the skin. There is also the CB2 receptor that is present on our immune organs that are our lymph nodes, our spleen, and then specifically our white blood cells known as leukocytes. On our smooth muscles, so this can be muscle, muscles like our vasculature where our blood is transported through. And then on our osteoblasts and osteoclasts that are responsible for the regulation of our bone mineral density. So as I mentioned, these are primarily shown the effects of marijuana specifically in the brain of those CB1 and CB2 molecules. And where we see the most potent effects are in what I would point out the amygdala. It's this really, really small section kind of on the bottom left of this screen in green. And what it's responsible for is the anxiety and motion, emotion and fear part of our brain. There's also effects that we can see on the hippocampus, which is uh, located just slightly uh, posterior or below that. And this can impact our memory, our learning facts, our uh, how to sequence events and uh, remember places and be able to orientate ourselves to the space around us as well. So what are some of the common uses that people report and what are some of the common side effects that people report? So what we've seen is that people use these primarily for pain issues. Um, it can help with nausea and vomiting. There are some products that we use for our appetite stimulation that have actually been developed using the THC molecule that we have adapted into pharmaceutical medicines. Um, muscle spasms is also present as a use. People use it for anxiety and with helping with sleep. And those two can be really closely correlated too. However, what we see with the most common side effects of this medical marijuana is the typical red eyes, patients can experience a really significant dry mouth to which there seems to be, from what I've heard, uh, a really difficult time trying to treat. And actually we've had patients in the hospital that even when we use uh, certain medications to increase the saliva, this still does not seem to help. 
as you can see, when it's used for sleep, it can cause that sleepiness or drowsiness and can also cause some dizziness. We've seen patients that have had really significant issues with, with falls, which can be important, especially in patients that are on anticoagulants, as we'll speak to later with our LVAD population, um, and having concerns for bleeds. And then difficulty focusing, which we can also see pretty frequently in dysphoria. So having kind of a panic or, or a not understanding of, of one's kind of space and, and the events that are going on around that patient. Logan, I just got to mention, I think the appetite stimulant might be an adverse effect for many. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it is dependent on the patient, we'll say. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Oh, here we go. So just to kind of give an overview of, of how the Minnesota medical cannabis program works is that a patient will have this qualifying condition that they have been diagnosed with by a physician. They have to have that proof of diagnosis, essentially that healthcare certification. Now, that is where the provider then leaves the situation. That patient shows that they have a report of that diagnosis through the provider to the uh, programs that are in place, and they get this uh, registration through those programs and through these centers that, as you can see on the bottom right of the screen, are all located throughout the state of Minnesota. They purposely did these locations in order to try and reach a broader client base and provide access to this care. Patient is then approved through their registry and given their, their card, essentially, is what many people call it. And they are then able to go into these centers and get their products. One thing I want to point out is that in the state of Minnesota specifically, the only products that are act actually available are the pill formulations, liquid formulations that are ingested orally, and then oil-based formulations that are inhaled through uh, a device. So this means that no plant products, no smoke products are available, which is something that we'll touch on a little bit later in the presentation as to why these can be important that they left them out. So what are some of those approved uses? As I mentioned, you do need to have a provider that is willing to diagnose these approved conditions. And once again, that is where the provider then leaves the situation of the registration. So we can see cancer associated with severe and chronic pain, nausea, severe vomiting, cachexia, which is a term used for when patients lose a significant quantity of weight and are unable to gain that weight back, also known as severe wasting. These are pretty severe disease states and, and we use any medications that we can to help treat these. Unfortunately, sometimes it's just not enough. Glaucoma is also listed as an approved use. HIV AIDS is an approved use and much of that goes along with similar uh, experiences to the cancer population. So looking once again at that nausea, vomiting, and cachexia. ALS is a diagnosis that is included. Seizures, including those with uh, epilepsy characterizations, are also present. We can see that people who have severe and persistent muscle spasms, including those characteristic of MS or multiple sclerosis, are allowed to use these products. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, as well as Crohn's disease, a terminal illness such as cancer or others with a probable life expectancy of less than one year. Now, this is obviously very difficult for physicians to diagnose of how long a uh, probable life expectancy is. So there is a little bit of gray area in that um, registration. Intractable pain, post-traumatic stress disorder, some features of autistic uh, kind of patients are also uh, allowed to register for this. Obstructive sleep apnea, Alzheimer's disease, and once again, that chronic pain uh, that is not associated with cancer or any uh, other illnesses it has also been recently approved. Kind of what I wanted to conclude from the medical marijuana portion, because as a pharmacist, I, I won't uh, state that I am a medical marijuana professional, nor do I uh, 
understand the 100% in and out of the utilization of it. Um, but I can conclude that the use of it is really more experimental at this time. Medical cannabis is not approved by the FDA, nor is it uh, federally currently mandated. Uh, medical cannabis can interfere with many of the drugs that you are taking, and we'll get into this when we speak to the CBD products as well. There is some evidence that use of cannabis while pregnant can actually cause harm to a developing baby or fetus. Recreational use of marijuana is known to cause some psychotic episodes. And one thing that I didn't put on the slide because the literature is kind of inconclusive at this time, but many patients also experience what is known as cyclical vomiting syndrome, where they have these episodes for hours to days that they just continually uh, have vomitus and are unable to control it with any antiemetics and they require hospitalization for hydration and other issues to get that controlled. Uh, risk of lung, lung damage from vaping. So as I mentioned, there are devices that utilize those uh, oil-based products. And what we've seen kind of in the last year, especially, uh, and this was heavily reported prior to COVID, is that um, these vaping devices can actually cause very significant lung damage to um, people utilizing them. Um, and unfortunately, it's really not well understood at this time. And a lot of research is still just in the beginning phases of understanding what is it that's causing these vaping injuries. But one thing I want to point out is that the preliminary data on these vape pens when utilizing specifically marijuana products and not the uh, nicotine products, but specifically the marijuana products has shown increased rates of infection and increased rates of these lung damage as opposed to, as, as I said earlier, that nicotine based product. And one thing I wanted to, to voice concern about, especially in our immunocompromised individuals, is that there's this mounting evidence to suggest that specifically the leaf product, so not necessarily what is provided here in the medical marijuana program, but the leaf product that would be got, uh, attained through um, not legalized sources may actually cause serious fungal infections known as aspergillus, which are very, very serious can drastically decline one's health and are very difficult to treat, requiring long-term treatments of months to up to years to actually clear infections. So utilizing those leaf-based, non-approved based products may be at a higher risk for individuals to um, have very significant declines in their health. So kind of moving on into the cannabidiol, and as Glenn said, these products seem to be everywhere these days. And I kind of want to talk about the uses and, and then really start to hone in on those drug-drug interactions. So where does CBD come from? So it's primarily derived from hemp, which is a variety of a cannabis plant. Now, the difference is, is that hemp typically has less than 0.3% of THC in it. And it's been used for thousands of years for clothing, fiber, um, whether it be kind of personal or industrial, as well as um, for rope. And in 2018, there was a farm bill that changed hemp from a scheduled product, as long as it has less than that 0.3 threshold of THC. Uh, unfortunately, state laws have not kept up with this change in many cases. Um, Minnesota has actually allowed uh, the hemp-based products to be um, grown here as long as they do follow that 0.3% THC guideline. And of note, I want to point out that um, for our patients that are bridged to transplant or are anticipating a transplant waiting on the list, um, we do take THC screenings very seriously for these patients um, and put that into their approval or continued status to remain on the wait list. And actually utilizing uh, some of these products can cause positive THC on a toxicology screen. So what are some of the common medicinal uses? So very similar to that of the medical marijuana, uh, we do see a lot of seizure-based disorders. Once again, that anxiety, the inflammation, the chronic pain, but a new one that we see is depression. So a little bit different in medical uses, however, some very common similarities. And as I touched on, 
this product is highly available. It's allowed over the counter. It's literally everywhere, it seems like. Uh, I do want to point out, though, that there are prescription products available. Once again, though, not only is it in those, every corner store that we see, as Glenn kind of alluded to, but products can be purchased on the internet. They can be bought at vitamin and supplement shops. They're present in multiple pharmacies, and, and this can kind of differ depending on whether it's a uh, industrial-based pharmacy like your CVSs and Walgreens versus more of the corner store um, mom and pop shops that we see kind of across the nation, as well as there are different laws uh, in, based on state government that can limit which places are allowed to uh, dispense the product. And then tobacco shops, which aren't too surprising. So I did want to talk specifically about one FDA product that is approved because although it is a, a product that we don't typically utilize for um, anything other than seizures, it is an FDA approved product, meaning it's gone through the intense screening of the FDA through phase one and through four trials to ensure that it was safe based on the dosing for adverse side effects, as well as that it met efficacy for treating seizures. So this is gonna be our strongest evidence to show A, what are our side effects, and B, what are our drug-drug interactions when used simultaneously. Um, I have seen this uh, specific product utilized here uh, at Fairview in our neurology unit where we do unfortunately have um, immunocompromised patients that do require use of this medication. So uh, once again, I won't state that I'm an expert on the product of this uh, specific medication, but I have uh, some experience utilizing it. So oh, uh, one important thing to understand is that the precise mechanisms by which this one product exerts its anti-seizure or anti-convulsants effects are not known even to uh, pharmacologists who study how the drug interacts on a molecular level. There's just so many diverse interactions throughout the brain that it's been hard to characterize exactly how it works as far as its efficacy. So I wanna point out that if we aren't even sure how the drug works, even though it does work, it may be real difficult, although we have these list of side effects, to know the full extent of what those side effects could be, as well as the intensity to which those side effects can occur. So cannabidiol, Oh, if you go back one moment, thank you, uh, does not appear to exert its anticonvulsant effects through the interaction with the cannabinoid receptors, which is really interesting because, as I mentioned previously, the, the CB1 and the CB2 receptors are present throughout the brain and can impact so many functions throughout our body. Interestingly enough, it doesn't actually utilize those pathways for its uh, mechanism. So looking at what it's used for, it, as I mentioned, is used for seizures uh, associated with two very rare syndromes uh, for essentially children and adults. Uh, it is only available as an oral syrup. Um, what I wanted to point out is the half-life. So what the half-life means to a pharmacist is the quantity of time in which from the moment that you ingest that drug, what will it take in timeline-wise for half of that drug to leave your body's system. And what we've seen in those FDA studies, which do require these half-lives to be reported, is that this specific product can stick around for 56 to 61 hours is just a half-life, meaning that in a health, otherwise healthy individual with perfect kidney function and perfect liver function, it can be in their system for up to seven days, possibly even longer. Now, when we look at someone who may have some kidney dysfunction at, at their baseline or some liver dysfunction at their baseline, you can push these times out because the drug is not being metabolized by the liver or removed through by the kidney. Now, speaking of metabolism, this specific product and most cannabidiol products, those CBD products, are metabolized in the liver and in the gut, but mostly in the liver. And I mentioned some enzymes here below and some isoforms. 
it's not important to know those specific ones. And we'll speak to and simplify these a little bit later. But I just wanted to, to have, in case there's anyone really interested in these topics, at least one mention of what those enzymes are in a more in-depth conversation. And, and Logan, if I could, could add, I think it's important, uh, if I understand right, uh, you're using this particular FDA-approved drug as, uh, as almost like the, the, the standard by which we could extrapolate all the varieties of CBD in which you're going to get into in a, in a couple of minutes. But because uh, there's very limited testing in the, I'll call it garden variety CBD, this has been tested. Uh, and so this is at least one kind of solid data point to, then to, to begin to look at the rest of it. Isn't that, isn't that right? That's correct. I, I couldn't have put it better. Um, I, I just, I'm utilizing this as a tool to essentially say as a blanket statement to all the products, because as I mentioned, or, and as you mentioned as well, uh, there really are not the studies available to even myself when I look into these products, because for one, there's so many of them already, but for two, there's new um, products hitting the market every single day, it seems like. So yes, you're absolutely correct. Great. So what are some of these negative adverse effects that we're seeing in the intense scrutiny of those FDA trials? So somnolence or, or some fatigue, some, some sleepiness, we saw in about 32% of people, and we saw fatigue in about 12%. So some real similar effects to that of the medical marijuana. Um, one thing that those studies don't show is the significance of that somnolence. So we use these terms to state that a patient experienced this side effect. But one thing that gets lost in these studies is the significance to which they experience it. So someone may report a adverse side effect as, oh, I have fatigue, but they may have just been tired that day compared to someone who may report it as fatigue of, I have been so tired, I haven't been able to get out of the bed for days. So that's one thing I want people to really understand about speaking to negative adverse effects, is that they're also a spectrum. They're not just black or white, I had it or I didn't have it. There's a spectrum to these. So I may mention the percentages at which they happen, but one thing that we don't get the opportunity to speak to is the significance to which they happen. So we did see some weight loss as well in those FDA trials. Some patients did experience a skin rash. Um, it was not mentioned in any of the data as to whether or not the physicians were thinking that this was due to allergic reactions or if this was just a rash brought on by the drug itself. Uh, decreased appetite, which was interesting because we see the inverse to that for our medical marijuana products. Diarrhea was present in up to 20% of patients. And as many of my transplant patients, I think, can attest that post-transplant, some of our medications can actually increase our risk of diarrhea, which we'll speak to a little bit later. And then one thing that was very important to look at was the infection rates. So what we did see was that there was a significant increase in bacterial, viral, and fungal infections in otherwise healthy individuals, all the way up to 41%. Now, one thing I want to point out is that the papers did not mention which specific bacteria, which specific viruses, or which specific funguses were present in the infections, or the duration to which they were treated. So this uh, infection adverse effect, although important, it's not well understood. And the important thing that I want to take away from this is that with a FDA approved product, we're still having high incidences of infection. Now extrapolate that to our non FDA regulated over the counter products that might be present at an even higher infection risk. So what are you getting in your CBD? So there was a study that was performed looking at specifically the over the counter CBD products. What this study looked at was specifically 84 products on the internet. Uh, they made sure not to have duplicate products. They then took these products and took a sample of it and blinded all of those samples to a lab out in Denver. 
and they tested these products for what their content of the CBD present in it, if there was any THC present in any of these products, as well as several other cannabinoids that might be similar to CBD but are not quite the same. The results were actually quite shocking. So 43% of these products had more CBD present in it than what it was labeled as. And this was a significant extra quantity, not just saying it's 0.1% difference. No, this is a significant extra quantity. 26% of these products had, had lower CBD content than what was proposed on the label. And only 31% of these were accurately labeled. So as we can see, these over-the-counter products that are not regulated by the FDA to state what's on your label must be uh, also present in your actual product. There's a high discrepancy between what you're actually getting and what's on that label. Also concerning, as I mentioned and kind of alluded to earlier, is that THC was detected in 21% of these over-the-counter products, which is very concerning for folks who are trying to remain on that wait list to receive their transplant. So I, I just really would like to, to stress that these over-the-counter products may not be exactly what you're intending to receive. And, and it may be, although what we'll get to later in talking about avoiding these products, uh, if one is to utilize them, the risk might be compounded exponentially. And, and for those uh, who remember the reference, they might want to think of poppy seed muffins in the Seinfeld show. So uh, if I might, uh, just as a time check, we're at about 37 after the hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've got some really great stuff still coming up, guys. So go ahead. Morgan. Um, so some precautions. I want everyone to be careful of the manufacturer claims. Uh, this is really important, as we mentioned on a previous slide. I want you to really consider staying away from the, especially the synthetic products. So there's hundreds of brands. So there's these K2s, these Spice, Black Mamba, all, are just some examples. They have these really strange names, but, but realistically, they are dangerous products. Most likely, you will get a positive marijuana test as we saw it from the results of that last study. And I really wanna stress that because these drugs, uh, which we'll speak to on the next couple of slides here, can impact the metabolism, of your uh, capabilities of your liver, that warfarin and immunosuppression medicines are impacted by this. Uh, I want people to understand that there are that there is that FDA approved indication, and that use should really only be um, undertaken when supervised by an MD, um, especially if using oncology items. And although we have not seen any studies to show that kidney damage can happen we have seen that hypertension is present when using these products long-term. And one thing that is an indirect effect of that hypertension is decreased kidney function in the long-term. So although we have not seen it yet, these products are, are so new that we really haven't had the opportunity to see that develop over the long periods of time. So touching on that drug metabolism. So metabolism of drugs and what I wanna say call foreign substances, so anything that we ingest, anything that we inject, anything we put into our body is primarily metabolized by the liver. It's a very important organ. It has more than 50 enzymes in its system. And six of those enzymes metabolize about 90% of drugs available on the market. So the important thing to understand is that THC and cannabidiol strongly inhibit, they stop or, or, or slow down or obstruct these, these enzymes. And there's three of them that are critical uh, enzymes that keep drugs in the body longer when it is inhibited. We're gonna call these enzymes A, B, and C just for the purposes of this presentation. And if anyone is interested, I'd be more than happy to uh, divulge which enzymes A, B, and C specifically stand for. But drug, I wanna also point out that drugs can also utilize multiple of these systems. So it's not just drug a matches to enzyme A. Drug A might also match to enzyme A, B, and C. So there's really this web that is created and inhibiting one of these might impact a drug. But what I wanna point out is that there's multiple pathways. So the THC and cannabidiol just really impact our drug metabolism ability. So important enzymes for drug A are very common medicines that we see specifically for acid reflux, such as pantoprazole or omeprazole, 
Warfarin is very present. Some of our antiplatelet medicines, uh, clopidogrel is present, and then some psych uh, psychiatric medicines. Uh, important enzymes for drug B or enzymes B are amiodarone, losartan, NSAIDs, and warfarin. And important enzymes in drugs, uh, enzyme C for drugs are, are antifungal medicines, fluconazole or posaconazole, those azole antifungals, diltiazem and verapamil, which are some blood pressure medicines. And then a lot of our immunosuppression medicines, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, sirolimus, some of our uh, prevention of infection medicines known as dapsone. So all three of these enzymes are inhibited or slowed down by THC or CBD, meaning that the drugs listed in each of these are actually increased in their concentration, increased in their uh, effects of what we want them to do therapeutically, but also increased in their potential for side effects. You know, I think this is a really great takeaway slide. We have a couple more that are coming up. Uh, and just to kind of directly connect dots for folks, you know, anybody on LVAD, you know, is, has to be very aware of warfarin, right? Uh, and uh, for those of us in the um, immunocompromised side with, with transplant, I mean, it's kind of a who's who of medications for us. And for those that are not familiar with fungal infections, uh, some of these are first line defense uh, if uh, one develops a fungal infection, which is quite common with uh, immunocompromised uh, folks like ourselves. Uh, Logan, I'll let you keep going. Just one, one note for you. Um, what one note for you? I know we've still got a lot of supplements to get to and, and um, just kind of consider the time. So. Yep, absolutely. So essentially, what does this all mean? So for our transplant patients, CBD and marijuana use can really alter the metabolism of a lot of our immunosuppression medicines. Those mainstays of therapy, the tacrolimuses, the cyclosporins, the sirolimuses, the everolimuses. This can actually increase your levels when looking long-term. Now, the issue is, is that these CBD products are used somewhat sporadically. So it can make your levels fluctuate and make it very difficult for your uh, coordinators and for your uh, physicians to manage these levels appropriately. So we can see highs and lows, which, which can drastically lead to either adverse side effects or possible risk for rejection, respectively. And when we look at our LVAD patients, the CBD and marijuana use can drastically alter the metabolism of our warfarin once again, making, putting our patients at very high risk for uh, either thrombosis of that LVAD, which is very, very serious, or significant bleeding risks. So really a conclusion is, is that these CBD products do have potential value in some conditions. However, uh, they are uh, unregulated at this time, which can lead to severe differences in the products that you're receiving there are very well-known interactions with variable consequences throughout our, uh, our metabolism system, and they drastically interact with our anti-rejection and anticoagulation drugs. And really, we just need a lot more research with consistent manufacturing products. So uh, looking at the dietary supplements, we'll, we'll go through these rather quickly. And, and I, I hope I summarized them all pretty well, but uh, as far as if they're safe, uh, which will be in green, whether uh, there is risk for use, but there is possible use, or whether there is just a kind of catch-all to avoid. So looking at specifically calcium and vitamin D, what I thought was really important to emphasize was that there are different forms of calcium and different forms of vitamin D, and there's different products based on those forms. So uh, the different forms may have differences in the uh, ability to be absorbed. So we look at Tums, which is a calcium carbonate based product, has about 40% of that elemental calcium in it. Now, what I wanna point out about these supplement products is that they're kind of tricky. Although they may say a certain milligram of them, what we're actually looking for is the elemental content of these. So you can see that the calcium citrate only has 21% of that elemental calcium when looking at the top left of the screen, whereas the calcium carbonate has about 40%. And when you look at your products and are shopping, uh, for over-the-counter products, which um, for calcium, which we'll get to in the next slide, is actually quite safe. Uh, there are just differences in their, those percentages, and th that's really the main takeaway of that first slide. So unfortunately, many of our medications can actually increase the risk for osteopenia or osteoporosis, which end up as bone fractures. 
long-term use of steroids known as prednisone, mycophenolate and azathioprine um, cause increased uh, risk of skin cancers, which we recommend our patients avoid the sun. Well, the problem is, is that you as a person are able to produce your own vitamin D by sun exposure. So we're actively telling you, don't get, the, don't get too much sun. And then we have our calcineurin inhibitors, tacrolimus and cyclosporin, that can actually cause harm to the kidney and decrease its ability to produce that active vitamin C. So when we look at calcium and vitamin D, it's actually quite safe. And we actually prescribe this to many of our heart transplant patients uh, looking long-term, as well as immediately post-transplant. Now, one thing I wanna point out is that it's important that there is a minor interaction between mycophenolate, also known as Cellcept, and calcium products. They can bind each other in the stomach. So it's really recommended to kind of take these one to two hours apart, if possible. And if uh, there are people out there suffering from having low phosphorus, which is also a complication of some of our medicines post-transplant, uh, if you take these calcium products without food, that will allow you to get your phosphorus levels up from your food because calcium also binds phosphorus. When we look at magnesium, once again, we're looking at that elemental magnesium, and there's different degrees to which uh, the elemental magnesium is present in these products. And one thing to point out is that magnesium is not easily absorbed in the GI tract. So it pulls water into this area, which can significant, cause significant diarrhea. And we know from speaking earlier that mycophenolate and other medications that we use post-transplant can also cause diarrhea. So we're kind of looking at adding to that effect of the diarrhea. So what are some of the common uses? We can use it for constipation, for migraines, but really we use it for these muscle cramps when patients have very low magnesium. And for heart transplant patients or patients on um, an LVAD, all, and as well as many other cardiac conditions, we try to keep uh, the lab level of magnesium above 2.0. So that's the important number. If you're below 0.20, Yes, magnesium therapy might be appropriate for you, but if you're above that, I would recommend that you don't need it. So I would say overall, it's considered safe to take when taken as prescribed or directed by your physician. Um, making sure to understand that if you are starting to take it and you do experience that diarrhea, it might actually be because of the drug itself. And that there are several of our uh, drugs that can cause this diarrhea and dehydration as well as the magnesium. One question uh, uh, came from Scott. Uh, does calcium only bind with mycophenolate? Do I need to be concerned with timing if I'm not taking mycophenolate? No, if, if you are not taking mycophenolate, there are no concerns for binding with any of the other immunosuppression medicines. Um, but if you are suffering from low phosphorus, uh, you are able to increase your phosphorus by taking calcium without food. So a very popular medicine, melatonin, what is the evidence behind it? So essentially this is a drug that mimics a hormone that is produced in the brain's internal clock and it helps with that sleep-wake cycle. There are some pretty unimportant safety events that have been, been seen, possibly headaches, drowsiness, dizziness, things you'd expect. But I would say that this is a generally safe product. It really doesn't have any serious side effects. Um, it is generally uh, taken commonly in the hospital with a lot of our transplant patients. One thing to consider though, is that it doesn't work immediately. In fact, it actually takes about one to two hours to take effect. And more importantly, this drug has really, the science would show, only been able to help patients fall asleep. It does not help them stay asleep. So just to set those expectations up prior to starting this medicine. When we look at fish oil, what is the evidence? So it has been used as a drug therapy for patients with really high triglycerides. And I provided that number specifically for you. But there's really conflicting results for other conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, eye diseases. A lot of people take this to quote unquote, reduce uh, the risk for heart disease. But really the data does not support that it actually reduces that risk. So if you're taking it solely over the counter and your provider doesn't know, you may not really be needing to take it uh, with the exception of if you have high triglycerides. Some of the adverse effects, 
are actually pretty serious. So we do see increased bleeding risk, especially with doses higher than 2,000 milligrams daily. And safety has not really been established for those with seafood allergies. So can you take fish oil if you have a seafood allergy? The, the, the jury is essentially out. Um, one common patient complaint that I hear all the time is that it causes these fishy aftertastes and what I've heard to refer to as fish burps. So in transplantation, I really see no reason why it, it would be considered as unsafe, um, especially when we're using it as prescribed for having high triglycerides, um, especially when we're using these mTOR inhibitors, such as sirolimus and everolimus, that are known to cause high triglycerides. However, in transplantation, when using it for a non-FDA approved indication, there really is no rationale or science to support the utilization of it. And when we look at our LVAD patients, that high risk of bleed, I would say that there is actually a high risk associated with using these products when using it over the counter, given that we're on so many uh, antiplatelet agents such as aspirin or clopidogrel or ticragular in combination with warfarin therapy. So when we look at coenzyme Q10, also known as quinine, there's really no significant data supporting its use in heart failure or blood pressure. It has been seen to have some conflicting data whether or not a statin induced, such as simvastatin or a torvastatin or rosuvastatin, that may cause muscle pain, whether or not it actually helps treat it. Some side effects might be rash, dizziness, uh, abdominal pain, but really what we see is that it increases, uh, uh, it actually increases your clot risk by decreasing the efficacy of warfarin. So in transplant, there is some risk associated with use uh, and I would say for our LVAD patients to really avoid these agents, knowing that that warfarin therapy is so vital to keeping their LVAD functional. When we look at vitamin C, this is one that I see very, very frequently, especially when I used to work in the outpatient setting. So overall, this is the most important thing, and I'm going to shock a lot of people. Overall, when you look at all the data combined, it does not prevent or treat or shorten common cold or flu. And I know that a lot of people might be thinking, oh, this guy's talking crazy talk. But when you look at all the data together, that is actually what it's shown. Now, what it has shown to be uh, as an effective therapy is for iron absorption. So for a lot of the patients who are anemic because they have iron deficiency, this might help when taken at the exact same time as those iron pills, as those iron solutions. What we see for adverse effects is very commonly we can see kidney stones. Excess vitamin C in the blood is known to cause these kidney stones, which are very, very incredibly painful for patients. And when we look at some products out available on the market, these packets of emergency and, and other uh, you know, tablet formulations that might just be for chewable, um, they come with 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams per packet. People will take multiple packets per day. But when we see what is utilized, even for diseases like scurvy, we only see 300 milligrams a day. So you're taking these mega doses and you're setting yourself up for a very increased risk for these kidney stones, especially if we have decreased kidney function to begin with. So as far as kind of the consensus statement. It can be used safely to aid in that iron absorption, but I would say there's actually a high risk of use, especially when using these excessive doses that are available over the market. And that goes for both transplant and LVAD recipients. You know, that's got to be a, you know, as, as I think you preluded with uh, uh, our preface, it's a, it's all, it, you know, it, it, we've been told for so long, oh, have plenty of vitamin C, have plenty of vitamin C, drink plenty of vitamin C. And, and so your research is actually showing uh, something different, it sounds. And especially for those of us, uh, you know, whether with an LVAD or a transplant, um, it, it actually can cause more issue than even, even the uh, suggestions. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and what I want to really kind of point out is that dietary... Uh, intake, such as drinking orange juice and through food items, has actually been shown to be beneficial. But it's when these supplement products are taken in such high doses that the benefit is not shown. 
Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Let's uh, keep going. So uh, one thing uh, before you go, uh, it looks like maybe Jerry had a question. Uh, if you want to type that in, uh, we'll get that answered as well. Get his hand up. Uh, but go ahead. Uh, so kind of keeping with the theme of cold and flu treatments, echinacea and or ginseng uh, is a major concern for transplant individuals on immunosuppression medications and patients on anticoagulation. So also our LVAD population. There are several of these enzymes that are inhibited uh, through use of echinacea and ginseng. And then the other interesting part is that ginseng can actually cause uh, what's called QT prolongation that can cause arrhythmias of your heart. So I would say these products are, regardless of their efficacy, highly risky for all individuals present on our presentation today. Now, zinc is one of the most other popular, probably dietary supplements. Now, it's important to separate, and this is where I wanted to take a very brief second to talk about homeopathy and homeopathic medications. And what these products are, because a lot of zinc products are actually shown to be homeopathic. And what this means is they take a small substance, like one milligram of zinc, and then they dilute it 100 times. And then they dilute it 100 times again. And then they dilute it 100 times for a third time. And if you look at the labeling, it'll say 1x or 2x or 3x, how many times it's been diluted. So really, there's no active drug or active zinc in the product anymore. It's essentially just some dilution of water. And, and so when we move and when we talk about zinc, it's really important if you are going to utilize the products, knowing that these homeopathic uh, uh, products are available on the market and to differentiate those between uh, products with true, as I call it, zinc in the actual product. So what is the evidence? Uh, zinc deficiency can cause immunodeficiency and impair wound healing. However, excessive zinc does not actually promote wound healing uh, and it would not impact the immune system. Uh, it can be used for the treatment of diarrhea, but really only those in third world nations, those who are very malnourished. And now what is the evidence for cold and flu season? And I'm possibly gonna shock a lot of people again, but the proposed mechanism is that zinc in the mouth and throat doesn't allow the virus to bind and get into our systems. Now, the only studies that have actually showed a benefit with zinc products based on this proposed mechanism is that these patients take a lozenge every two to three hours and keep it in their mouth the entire time, as well as some kind of syrups that might be available on the market. Can you imagine taking a medicine every two to three hours every single day for two weeks? I, I know I would have a very high difficulty with that. And most studies actually, when looking at dosing beyond those three hours, so twice a day or once a day, actually were very comparable to just taking a sugar pill. So I'd say the evidence is really kind of poor for these products. You know, it's funny. Uh, I'll admit, I, I tried uh, zinc product a, a few times in the past, and I always read the label. And the label said, you know, make, you know, do it every every four hours or whatever. And I always thought, well, I'm going to bed. I'm going to sleep for eight hours. Well, they don't say get up in the middle of the night and take it. They just you know, so I was like, well, does it really, you know, is it okay to leave a big old window? And what I hear you saying is, well, A, if it works, B, it really has to be regimented every two to three mm -hmm. hours. So the practicality of it's pretty difficult. Absolutely. Okay. So what is really the consensus on this? They're generally safe products, but there's just such a minimal benefit as well as a cost of these products that is associated that a lot of times we forget about. You buy these over-the-counter products, they're not cheap for most of them, as well as maybe you're not getting a benefit for your dollar. So your dollar may be better spent, uh, you know, getting an orange juice or get drinking more fluids, buying a water. Uh, but you're not drinking the orange juice for the vitamin C? Well, so uh, dietary intake once again, but not the okay. supplement intake. Got it. Uh. Important note. So another popular um, dietary supplement is garlic. So really these are just small kind of low quality evidence studies. There's really not a lot of strong evidence to say they work. Now they do have some adverse effects such as bad breath, increased risk of bleeding, which can be important. 
But the other important factor is that it can inhibit those enzymes once again. And we use these terms SIP uh, number letter number for those enzymes classification. And tacrolimus and warfarin fit within those enzymes that once again are uh, being impacted by the use of this garlic. So I would say avoid the use as a supplement, but it's absolutely safe in cooking. The, the quantity at which you're taking as a supplement is, is many, many times higher than throwing a clove of garlic in your food. A uh, popular one is turmeric, or also known as curcumin. And it's a plant in the ginger family, mainly found in curry powder. Several, several drug interactions that uh, I, I mentioned here on the right side of the slide. Uh, immunosuppression medicines, anticoagulation medicines. Once again, your iron absorption has changed. So essentially, to put this easily, we just recommend against the use of turmeric in any of our heart transplant and or LVAD patients. How about Indian food? Indian, once again, similar to garlic, the, the quantity at which you'd be taking is substantial. So as a supplement, avoid use. Indian food, perfectly fine. You're talking, you know, just a, a, a dash as compared to a capsule that is, you know, the size of your thumb. So when we look at glucosamine and chondroitin, these are commonly utilized for osteoarthritis of knee joints. There is some evidence to support that they do improve the pain and function of knees. Um, and you know, knee problems can be uh, especially common as we age. There are some differing opinions as to when looking at just otherwise healthy individuals. The, the United States actually recommends against utilizing these agents, whereas the European society actually strongly recommends for. So you can see there's some conflicting not only just data, but conflicting ideas on how to utilize these medicines. But when we look at our, our, our populations that we're speaking to today, specifically, it might be safe in, in transplant recipients. However, there are major interactions with warfarin, as well as other bleeding risks that are associated with the use of both of these agents. So I would say that there is risk associated with use, but if you're being followed closely with your INR and your physician is the one who prescribed these medicines, then you should be at a lower risk for having those complications. Now, a common, common question, probiotics and prebiotics. So probiotics uh, and, and the marketing for these over-the-counter products has been fantastic in their, in their marketing. However, when you look at the actual pooled studies and you say, is this efficacious for treating this condition against a placebo, there is no evidence to say that these probiotics are actually effective compared to those placebos. Specifically for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, infectious diarrhea that can be caused by like E. coli 0157, irritable bowel syndrome, Clostridium difficile infections, which are very common in transplant recipients, unfortunately. Unfortunately, these probiotics do not help. Lactose intolerance and constipation, also, there is no data to suggest that they are efficacious. What I want to point out is that there are some small studies that have shown increased risks of infections from these probiotics, which can be very detrimental to transplant patients' health. We've seen several instances where there's bacteremias fungemias, and peritonitis, meaning bacteria that get into the blood, fungus that get into the blood, and then bacteria that can get into the abdominal cavity. Also, these products are very high in cost. I think I looked at one product specifically that was over $20 for just a bottle of 30 capsules, and you were supposed to take one capsule with each meal. So that's $20 almost within a week and a half that you're going through. There are risks associated with use. So I would recommend consulting a physician prior to use, but more importantly for our transplant patients, I would recommend avoiding these if possible. Um, I know that you know post-transplant diarrhea is very common for a uh, myriad of kind of disease states, whether it be you know C. diff infections, mycophenolate, or just just issues in general with diarrhea from pre-transplant, but using these agents, it's not efficacious for what the data shows us, and there are significant 
kind of detrimental effects of them. Now, looking at prebiotics, there just are very, very limited studies to say, are they efficacious or not? Now, these are just kind of how I would explain uh, things that feed the bacteria in your gut that really you could just get through any normal stereotypical American diet. So I would say they're generally safe, but once again, very high cost associated with them. So one thing that I would say you can use, but just be cautious of your wallet. So really to kind of just summarize all of this. So dietary supplements are not regulated by the FDA for the purity, potency, and proof of efficacy. This is the same as for the CBD products. Rarely, these are in, uh, insurance covered and they have a high out-of-pocket cost. The claims of the treatment might be uh, exaggerated or unproven. Like I said, with several of these products, the marketing is fantastic. They, I gotta applaud their marketing teams. And there's many unknown drug interactions and adverse effects. And I, uh, you can see on the right that I kind of tried to summarize as best I could, which ones are generally safe in more of a list format for all of you. Yeah, that's a great summary, thank you. And the last thing I always like to touch on is as I mentioned in the previous slide, a lot of these products are not regulated by the FDA. So there is a third party organization known as the United States Pharmacopeia or USP for short, that has tested many products that are available on the market and they will have this green and yellow seal on the bottle that have shown that they, what is on the label is in the product itself. So they are proven to be uh, appropriately labeled and, and possibly safe for use. Great. And with that, I'd like to take any questions and, and also I'd like to thank all of you for your, your time today.